All right, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. The book of Acts will be um, picking up at chapter 16. <clears throat> chapter 16. So, um, Brother Chris finished off um, lesson 28 last week. Um, I noticed um, that Brother Craig had started on lesson 29 here. Um, and he got through got through it for the most part. So I'm going to pick up on that last part of lesson 29 where we're going to be discussing Lydia, and then we'll jump into lesson 30. So <clears throat> the gospel goes west. Um, this is going to be this covered uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. Um, at this point in my study in the book of Acts, we've come to the second missionary journey of Paul. The scriptures reference for the second ministry, excuse me, missionary journey span from Acts 15 and verse 40 to Acts 18 and verse 22. This journey is known to be dated around AD 50 to uh, AD 54. The journey covered three distinct fields, Asia Minor, see that in chapter 15, verse 40 to chapter 16, verse 10. Macedonia, that's uh, uh, chapter 16, verse 11 through 17, verse 15, and Achaia, chapter 17, verse 16 through chapter 18 and verse 22. So this trip, this trip um, in itself was extremely successful and the longest as well. It was said to cover close to 667 miles. Amazing. <laughs> You have to think, too. Paul didn't have any Toyotas or Hondas as we do today. He didn't have no, you know, uh, Ford trucks or nothing like that. You know, this is by foot, a uh, boat, and uh, maybe a donkey at, at the very most, you know, 667 miles. A few weeks ago, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Brother Craig covered this lesson, and he got down to verse 13 um, in chapter 16. So we're going to put our focus there, and then we're going to move forward. So. Uh, this is where Lydia was introduced. So we're going to pick up uh, at that verse and discuss the events that occurred. And then we'll move on to lesson 30. So scene one, a woman. Scene one, a woman. If I could get a reader for verses 13 and 14, Acts chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. That's it. That's it about that. it so back in those days, um, cities were walled. Um, I often think about you know the city of Jericho and think about uh, different cities being a wall. Um, and one entered them and departed from them through gates. As we just read, we see that some women were meeting in an open place near a river. And at that time, there were no synagogues in Philippi because the city had to have at least 10 Jewish family heads before it could have a synagogue. From this information, we can conclude that there must not have been many Jews uh, that lived there currently in Philippi. Throughout scripture, we read that Jews would often meet near bodies of water suitable for ceremonial washing. Uh, we see that in Ezra. Oops. We see that in Ezra chapter 8 and verse 15 and 21. We also read of the Jews in Babylonian captivity, sitting down by the rivers of Babylon and lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem. You see that in Psalm uh, 137 verse 1. This particular river was called, I hope I say this right, Gangai. Gangai, sometimes spelled G-A-R-G-I-T-E-S, Gargai. And it was one mile west of the town. Then we get to verse 14. Well, Brother Chris um, just read that verse there, 13, 14. This verse tells us that among the women was one named Lydia. 
we see that she was a known worshiper of God and a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. Now, when we see the color, uh, that color purple um, in scripture, what does it usually signify? What does that indicate? Royal. That's one thing about God. Yes, royal. And when you're a royalty, you have quite a bit of money, right? <laughs> so the significance of the color purple back in those times um, often indicated you were a royalty or possessed uh, great riches. Purple was a most valuable color and was obtained usually from shellfish. One tiny drop of dye was obtained from each fish. That's a lot of fish there. Purple fabric was in high demand by the rich, being that it was used as the official toga in Rome and in the colony. Verse 14 also shows that she listened with intent. She heard the words of Paul that were taught, and her heart was opened by the Lord. Now let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So this is something that we hear quite often. We hear this quite often in the religious world. Of course, you know, there's nothing with the, wrong with the term itself, but it's extremely important to understand what it means, especially when we are speaking of our own soul salvation. We oftentimes hear denominational preachers telling individuals to open up their heart and let Jesus come in. They will also say things like, just give Jesus your heart. Again, there's nothing wrong with what is being said because Jesus does, in fact, want to take up residency within our hearts. But again, we need to have a proper understanding of what that means and what it looks like. So we're keeping that in mind, I pose the question, what is the scripture telling us when it says, the Lord opened Lydia's heart? What is that scripture saying? Let's go. Conscious what? A conscious heart. Her mind? Okay. Yes. Open up, open her mind to a, uh, perhaps a better understanding. Great point. Great point. Anybody else? Open up that conscious mind. Read the scripture. Go hand in hand. Amen. Anybody else? So, it's just a side note. As uh, so, um, again, what opens up the uh, what? What did it mean for Olivia's heart to be So. God worked here the same way he did, uh, as we see in all the other conversions. He opened her heart through the word. And as Brother John alluded to here, you know, heart can be uh, synonymous with, with your mind. Uh, he opened up her heart through the word. The heart is open when the gospel message is received and the response to obey follows shortly afterward. Uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 8 and verse 6. Brother Mike. As we turn in there, Acts chapter 8, verse 6. <laughs> That's what it means. Okay. Have that heart opened up. Yes, ma'am. Brother Mike. <laughs> Close it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. If you want to see a direct contrast, look at that. <laughs> look at that. He closed his heart to God. 
Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 6. Black contrast in there. All right, so the same verb meaning to give attention or to give heed um, here in this passage is used, uh, as used in this verse, it's translated as respond. So I'm actually that that's um so there's action along with uh having your heart open that. Um turn to Acts chapter two and verse thirty-seven. We know this verse. <laughs> Acts two thirty-seven. Just long as you have a um, <clears throat> I was just gonna refer to the parable of the summer and how like the preparation of your heart is your own work. Yeah. Right? Like it, it, whether it's receptive or not. You know, it's something that we're responsible for. So she had already prepared her heart to accept what was said. Right. Unlike Pharaoh, you know, uh, he was already hardened. He had his heart not prepared. She was a worshipful of God already. So maybe it was a, kind of like uh, the case of Cornelius as well, you know. So uh, that's why we have to be careful what we put in our hearts. Yeah. You know, that's all we have to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very arrogant. Uh, um, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Acts 2, 37. Thirty-seven. Acts two thirty-seven. Yes, ma'am. Now, when they heard it, they were pricked in their heart and said, "Peter had the rest of the apostles and the brothers, what should we do?" So we see that word "pricked." You know, when we see "pricked" in this verse, it means that um, gives the idea of cutting deep. You know, cutting deep into their heart, but. Uh, we can see that the same principles apply. Um, once they realized they crucified uh, the Lord, their hearts were open, and Peter, Peter preached the first gospel sermon, and men and women obeyed right then and there. Um, all right, let's get back to um, Acts 16. Let's get back to Acts 16. That's a little things there to consider when we talk about with your heart being open by the Lord. Let's get back to Acts 16. Let's read verse 15. We're still on that topic here. <laughs> and when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Okay. Now, if Lydia's heart was closed, do you think she would have been baptized after Paul's name? Absolutely not. Do you think she would have invited those brethren into her house with open arms if she had a closed heart? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is what it looks like when the Lord takes up residency in your heart. Lydia heard Paul's teaching. She obeyed the gospel and then continued living it out because the Lord opened her heart. Letting Jesus into your heart is not just some tagline to say. It is carried out by taking action and doing what the Lord requires of you. Uh, comments or questions before we move on? Like, the doctor is commanded for a good heart to receive 
receive it, she opens up her home. She's not looking down at everything she has. She's willing to share. And so you see this, this harmony that is not the conflict and trying to, one trying to lord over the other. I mean, you're concerned about the soul of the And that is a prime object of being concerned about the soul salvation of men. And that's where, as I said, a lot of people spend so much time and attention to things that are insignificant. You know, the most important thing is to make sure that that person, uh, that person's soul is safe. You know? And Lydia play, played a big role in um, having a place, um, a headquarters for Paul and the other brethren in the day, you know, during that time, you know. And uh, we're going to read about later um, what happened between him and the uh, young girl later on in this, this chapter. But um, they had a place to stay, you know, and that, and that means a lot, you know, just a little so. Um, anyone else? Comments or questions? All right, let's uh, let's move on to lesson 30. So let's move on to lesson 30. We'll talk about more conversion and so Brother Mike. Just one comment, you know, about um, because today it seems like we have changed. Yeah. We are not as open as these people were Christians in Boston. Because today people have a problem with staying in the now they mention her and her husband. And she's a household, she's probably servant and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't tell her to, uh, you know, that she was a widow. I don't know. And there were other women with yeah, the two. Other women. Yeah. So today people would have an issue with that stuff. But we don't see that anywhere here. You know? So, you know, I just wanted to point that out today. You know, we're just not as open as Christians. You know, doing God's will, the innocent to the doing God's will, but then you have them lost. You know, we always want to get the negative and say, oh, look what could happen to this, this, you know. And I don't understand where that's from. I get that from the thing that you know, so I said, like you said, the most important thing is that we should be focused on spiritual matters. Yeah. Yeah. Great point, brother. Great point. Great point. <laughs> All right. So, uh, lesson 30. What was lesson 30? More conversion in Philippi. Continue in chapter 16. So, we just seen the first European converts in Lydia and her household. Uh, now, the story focuses on another woman, a young woman who was possessed uh, by an evil spirit of some kind. Uh, this particular event will show the impact of Christianity upon Greek slavery. Now, as we continue to read throughout this chapter, we can gather that apparently uh, the Christians continue to use the meeting place by the river uh, as a setting for prayer and teaching. Some few days after the conversion of Lydia, Paul and Silas met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, and scripture indicates that she was demon possessed. So um, if I could get a reader for Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 19. It's the same two of girl. Same two of girl. 16 through 19. <clears throat> and it came to pass as we went to prayer, our certain damsel, possessed with the spirit of every man, met us, which brought her master much gain by six days. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of God most high. I'm sorry, these men are the servants of the most high God, which showed unto us the way of salvation. And this did many, and this did she many days. But Paul, being free, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the whole of their game was done, they called Paul and Silas and drew them out into the marketplace unto the ruler. Amen. Thank you. All right. This poor young girl was demon possessed and was being used to bring her master's profit by fortune teller. See, at the center of the slave master's hearts lies 
greed, and covetousness. They were willing to do anything to get money, even if it meant using a young girl with an unclean spirit. As we continue to read this passage, we will see that covetousness demeans integrity. Uh, we can see that by the way this young lady is treated. We will see how covetousness deters the truth. We will see that from the lies that were told about Paul and Silas. And covetousness demands injustice. We will see that by the way Paul and Silas were treated. Again, it demeans integrity, deters the truth, and demands injustice. Brethren, covetousness is a very, very serious problem. Let's look at a few passages that talk about covet that talk about covetousness. Let's um, read a couple of passages where Jesus uh, speaks on this matter. If you would turn with me to Mark chapter seven, and we'll read verses seven, excuse me, twenty through twenty-three. Mark seven, twenty through twenty-three. I right, get a reader there. Mark seven twenty through twenty-three. Uh, yeah, Mark 7, 23, 23. And he said, What comes out of the man that drowns him? From the water, and the thing out of the heart of man is the evil thought, the adultery, fornication, murder, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, rudeness, and I see a lot of blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from the man that drowns him. Thank you, Mom. Look at all those things that covetousness is associated with. All those different things. Uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 12 and read verse 15. Luke 12, 15. Take you and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists in not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Amen. All right, now let's look at what Paul says about covetousness um, in his letters to the church. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. Ephesians 5, 1 through 4. He therefore follows the God of your children, who dwells in love with Christ, who also has loved us, and has given himself for us, offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smell of sin. Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be one thing among you as the other saints. Be the filthiness of human thoughts and the essence which are not convenient, but rather a great thing. That's what I'm like. Paul saw covetousness is pretty serious, right? He said, let it not be named once among you. All right, let's turn to Colossians chapter 3, we'll read verses 1 through 5. Colossians 3, 1 through 5. If you see it in vain, Christ is what says which are above the Christ, sitting on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above and out of the things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Modify therefore the members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Amen. So that's what Paul writes to his letters in the church. Now let's look at what the Hebrew writer right in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. Hebrews 13 verse 5. This will be our last verse to touch on here, but there's plenty of other ones throughout God's word. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. <clears throat> but your conversation be without consent with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Brethren, if we have covetous, if we have a covetous heart, we need to put it off and learn content. Covetousness will lead you down the path of sin, 
while in contract, godliness with contentment will bring great gain. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. So this brings us to uh, the last passage we're going to read, and this will uh, get us right back to Acts 16. Uh, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. I'll read that passage there. 2 Peter 3, verse 3. Now, in this passage, uh, Peter is speaking of false teachers, but uh, we see it's very similar to the slave master's character uh, found in Acts 16. Um, let's go back up. Let's go back to verse 2. So, beginning at verse 2, 2 Peter verse 2, Peter said, And many shall follow their pernicious way, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, they shall... The, excuse me, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. This is exactly what they did in Acts 16. They deterred the truth and made merchandise of that poor girl for their own monetary gain. Brethren, the fact of the matter is that. Some people will do anything for money. They don't care who it hurts. They don't care who they have to use to get it. They don't care if they earned it by simple ways. That's because those individuals possess a covetous heart. This is why Paul says to the church, let it not be once named among you as the common thing, because having this mentality will lead you away from God. Thomas, a question. I think you you said that this comes up a little bit because it's easy to see this in others because we always look at it at screen like Bernie Madoff and somebody who's stealing billions or millions of dollars, but it's like this is in the life of the Christian where we can act like this when we perceive something is being taken from us. And then we react in a violent destructive way attacking a brother or sister and not really understanding that we are caught up in it. Like when our emotions are so caught up and we see that we feel like we're losing something. Like my dreams are being impacted, my life has been impacted. Instead of like, no, we are pursuing something in a sense of manner and we need to kind of draw back out to it. You know, one thing Christian always has to do is see the forest and the trees. You know, <laughs> there could be a lot of things that's going on in this lifestyle, that's on in this life, and, you know, a lot of things that you could want, but we have to stay focused and keep our treasures in heaven. That is the main problem with the Christian. Um, to make sure that we um, stay focused on heaven and take it as many with us as we can, you know, by teaching the gospel. And you'll see it during the Christmas season. It's like, is it about family and togetherness? Absolutely. Or is it about what's under that tree? Absolutely. If you unwrap something and it's not what you want, and see and your disposition is style and that point on, then it's like, what is your real it's season of giving, though? It's a season of receiving. Absolutely. <laughs> so that is what the truth is. Great. And that you want to receive something instead of giving of yourself and Having that time together, so we can always say the right thing, but your actions will display for your heart. Absolutely, absolutely, very well said. Absolutely, and that's always been Christian mentality. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we're born to receive. You know, so um, Mike. It's interesting how uh, Paul was troubled with this woman going behind him and you know these men are. God. Yeah. You know, it's like she it's like she's paying a compliment, right? But you don't need that kind of confirmation from someone who just I think you said. <laughs> and uh so he's troubled here. But then when the demons get cast out, the people making money from her are troubled. Now, yeah, right. because of covetousness. But it's funny that they blame Paul and God and say, these men troubled our city. You know, this kind of reminds me of um, when we go back to uh Ahab. Mm -hmm. king, yeah. And he said, Life is trouble to Israel. Oh, my people didn't want to trouble in Israel with me. Absolutely. And let's get there, Brother Mike. Great point, brother. Great point. So, 
Eventually, Paul commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the young girl. And as a result, we see that they, uh, we will see that they were brutally beaten and thrown in prison and punished. Uh, this brings us to our next topic um, in the study. Brings us to our next topic in the study. Uh, Paul and Silas are rested. We'll be covering verses 20 through 24. So, uh, Brother Mike, if you would read those verses for me. 20 through 24. Brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, we teach customs which are not lawful for us to do, neither to observe the promise. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates went up and forth with the man to keep them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they passed them to the prison charging the jailer to keep them safe. And having received such a charge, thrust them into the tent of prison and made their feet fast and stopped. Mm. Mm. So, here we see a uh, quote unquote charge was made against Paul and Silas and they received. In uh, that day, you know, men could do their own arresting, so uh, that is what happened here. It was some sort of a citizen's arrest, and for whatever reason, uh, they decided not to arrest Luke and Timothy. Uh, but they were brought to the magistrates, who were basically uh, leaders of an army, somewhat like a general. Uh, outside the army, the term was given to the highest office holders in the colony. Of course, no trial was held in this event. They were accused by the people. They were deemed guilty, and within an instant, Paul and Silas's robes were stripped from them, and they were beaten and thrown in prison. No appointed judge was present, just an uprising of the people who were against them. So this was the first record of Christians being persecuted in Europe. Um, let's see here. Um, this was the first persecution. Uh, we'll read about that in um, well, actually verses 22 to 24. It says that. So again, this was the first persecution of Christians that we know of in Europe. Uh, and to be honest, there never has been a time when Christianity has been unchallenged. Generally, when it has been most fiercely assailed, it has been most successful. And we see this throughout Scripture. We read about that all throughout Acts, how um, it continues to grow, how the church continues to grow even during times of harsh persecution. As long as Christians are here on this earth, we will always have a spiritual war to fight. While we are living this life, following Christ, adding to the Christian graces, and spreading the gospel as we all, it is a given that we will suffer persecution for doing good in the eyes of the Lord. In verses 22 through 24, the magistrates begin delivering the punishment themselves by tearing their clothes from them in order to quiet the righteous crowd. As I noted before, apparently there was no serious investigation of the charges. Uh, this meeting um, in itself, when we focus on Paul, was one of three that he suffered during his lifetime of preaching. In 2 Corinthians 11.25, he says, Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I had spent in the deep. Now, I know earlier in our study, I was throwing that term, you know, prison around, but uh, after they were beating with rods, verse 24 tells us, and uh, Brother Mike placed an emphasis on that word, they tell us that they were thrust into the inner prison. The inner prison. So this holding cell was much different uh, than the typical prison holding cell. As scripture shows, stocks were used in this cell. There were probably some rats down there. And very little light and air was present. These cells were often compared to the dungeons of the first century. With that being said, Paul and Silas most certainly were not in a favorable position when you consider the pain they must have been in and the environment currently surrounding them. However, they knew spiritually that they were in a favorable position to the Lord. And that trumps everything else when you are doing right by the Lord. 
First Peter 2, 19, 20 says, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men revile you and persecute you and shall say all men are evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which are born before you. When we suffer for righteousness sake, it pleases the Lord. And Paul and Silas knew this. They took what they were going through and counted it as a blessing. They knew that they were suffering for the cause of Christ. And you can see their mentality, their hearts, and their love for the righteous living being manifested in verse 25. Let me get a read for verse 25. At midnight, Paul is down to pray and sing praises unto God in prison and Persia. Amen. These brothers were praying and singing. <laughs> You know what, brother? What this uh, Silas didn't blame Paul for heading up that demon either. Because when you do somebody, <laughs> you do some actions that may cause us both to suffer. You didn't see them him attacking Paul. You know, Silas was right there with him. He's like, I had it. I didn't care if that demon out. I, I was just walking with you. The next thing you know, I'm caught up in something that you did. And this young but, Paul. but you know, most people would try to distance themselves. I didn't do this. Why am I down here? But you I went along it. with it and supported your brother and you was there with him and you didn't say, why did you do this? You just absorbing the situation and being a pauper instead of looking at the other person and be like, yeah. you know that we do sometimes, people. Absolutely. 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 Man, great point, brother, too. You know, they didn't forget the reason why they were both in the situation. You know, they, they focused on why they were suffering, you know. A lot of times we try to shift that blame on someone. You know what I mean? A lot of times we try to shift the blame. But again, it goes back to where their hearts were. You know what I mean? They were doing God's will and they were suffering because of it. And Jesus said to uh, you're blessed when you're suffering for righteousness. Great point, but Chris. They didn't shift that blame towards one another. So again, when we suffer for right for righteousness, it, it pleases the Lord. Um Again, these brothers were praying and singing praises to God at midnight, nonetheless. You see, it can be quite easy to sing God's praises when things are going well, but it takes a strong faith to sing his praises when everything is going wrong. How do you, how do we react when things aren't going the way we want at our job, in our home, in our marriages, in our lives, how about when the fire is turned up and we are being persecuted for righteousness? How do how do we get? Yeah. You pray. Pray. That's a, that's a good reaction. <laughs> pray. James one two three says, "My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials." This is the New King James Version, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This should be our attitude, brethren. This should be our attitude when our faith is tried with persecution and various trials. How much questions before we close here? Go back. Just back to what Chris said, you know, uh, all inside of Tim and they're complaining because Luke and Timothy were there too. Yeah. <laughs> they they Why did they do that? Because they didn't know that. 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 Because they didn't know that.
Uh, we're going to close there um, this morning. Uh, before closing, I'd like to extend an invitation for those who would like to uh, begin that journey in developing a close and personal relationship with Christ uh, by putting him on and being added to his body. Uh, how do we do that? Well, the same way uh, Lydia did it when her heart was opened by the Lord. She heard the whole truth of God's word that was taught to her by Paul. Uh, Romans 10, 7 says, faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. She believed those gospel truths based on the actions that followed shortly after. She, along with her household, would then go on to be baptized for the mission of sins. Peter says in his sermon in Acts 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Uh, afterwards, she lived a repentant, faithful life to Jesus, and when this life is over, heaven will be your home. Um, if you are subject to the invitation, um, whether, you're, whether you're here, present, or uh, you're watching us from home, please contact us and we will set it free. Uh, any comments or questions for you? Thank you so much for your uh, comments and reading of the scriptures and time here with, with us this morning. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, please stay with us. We will be beginning our morning worship services at 11. Again, thank you.